Again, I'd like to thank uh, Neil Leach and Roland, who's not here today, as well as the Dean for really organizing this uh, pretty amazing event and uh, getting all of you guys here. Uh, for those of you who have traveled, I'd like to thank you as well. Um, I'd also like to thank Neil and, and Roland for giving me the privilege of introducing Patrick Schumacher. Um, I'm going to go through a few accolades and then, and then hopefully say something a little bit more important. Um, Patrick is, uh, I think, the only partner really with Zaha Hadid at Zaha Hadid Architects. He's the author of, uh, well, I would say almost countless papers and lectures and an upcoming book, which I think he will be talking about. Um, more personal to me and to many people, um, he was really the founder and one of the, the directors and continues to be one of the directors of the AADRL in London, um, which has proven to be, I think, a si significant uh, program in the world. Um, he's also a professor at Innsbruck University and a visiting professor at the Angevanta in Vienna. Uh, I think most importantly, uh, I was trying to, to think about how do you introduce Patrick Schumacher? Um, and you know, being in academia, I think it's a question of uh, how do you judge somebody's relevance in some ways? And um, the way that I think uh, I would judge Patrick's relevance is not only on the numerous buildings that are now built and the numerous competition wins that are uh, um, elegant and uh, incredible, but also on the generation of people that he's influenced as an educator and a thinker and a theorist. Um, uh, and sort of lastly, as an anecdote, I was in China last month uh, with a number of people here in the room. And I think in one conference on parametric uh, uh, practices in, in Xi'an, there were something like 25 people that were uh, all there as practitioners and observers that were all at one point in time uh, a student of Patrick Schumacher's. Uh, and I think that's probably the greatest accolade and uh, introduction I can give. So please welcome Patrick Schumacher. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, David, for the generous introduction, and thanks, Neil, for inviting me. Um, this will be a fast-track lecture. I will argue that instead of talking about parametric techniques, we can be and should be talking and promoting a new style, which I've termed parametricism which is of the same magnitude, profundity, and importance, I think, um, as modernism was, transforming the face of this planet in the first half of the 20th century. And I think what we're forging here and what we're working on has this degree of, of interest and importance, and I, I perceive it in places like this, but places in, also in China, in India, in, and of course in London, and in many other er uh, schools of architecture and young architects that everybody wants to participate in this new paradigm of new way of working, new values, new ideas, new concepts. And I'm trying to uh, define those and bring this discourse very close to architecture and urban design, not conf to be conflated so much with urban planning and the politics of... Um, urbanization, I think there we need to draw a distinction and what we can and, and understand what the discipline of architecture can contribute in a kind of overall process of civilization, but it cannot substitute itself for the politics and politics of urbanization. So we're staying with urban design under, but we have to reflect, of course, the societal conditions in which this is taking place, and this will be one of the aspects that we'll be talking about. But before I'm going into uh, parametricism, and kind of and giving an operational definition of it and showing uh, the principles which drive it, I want to invite you to join um, the opening of a building which has been a long time in the making for over 10 years, the Rome Museum, National Italian Museum of uh, Contemporary Art and Architecture called Maxi, which was opening uh, very, very recently, and I brought some images it is still relevant. It brings us back right into the domain of, uh, of architecture. And I think as architects, we appreciate this work. But it also speaks to and is embedded within the uh, definition of parametricism, even though its generation and design process was not dependent on kind of more sophisticated parametric techniques we are now kind of investing ourselves in. 
but uh, I will show you a few hints and glimpses that the project participates in that overall paradigm shift uh, we're now observing and uh, promoting. So this is, um, I'm going to click through that quite quickly with here and there, maybe make a few comments on this uh, project, um, just the way it sits as an extension of a kind of field, the way it kind of resonates perhaps with the river, a kind of sense of embedding, it's not an object, it creates a kind of field and participates in a field, it draws in uh, urban dir directionalities, which are uh, multiple and mediates them into this kind of uh, field condition. This was the original design. If you can see that um, there is elements missing, which uh, an existing building embedded here, um, as I said, uh, urban directions con con uh, taken up, mediated two urban grids, and what also it kind of embeds another project and extends as a non-object kind of field condition. <coughs> And it's been a kind of true to intention executed as a um, field out of line elements. The, the initial concept was to take the uh, essential functional component of a museum, which is the gallery display wall, as a uh, constituting element and irrigate that field with walls, allow, set the, these up into a, a condition of parallel move and having through the intersection of these walls setting up interior and exterior spaces and then kind of proliferated elements through ribs and um, trusses to create that kind of uh, formal universe which, which delivers the, uh, this institutional building. I'm just clicking through how this kind of appears as you go closer, as you move closer, there's a certain degree of monumentality and s simplicity in uh, some of the space and, and, and picks up a lot of energy and, and complexity uh, at certain key moments, singularities, let's say, in the field. And I think there's an interest in, in the um, kind of layered depth um, of um, and staggering of, of spatial connections and deep visual penetration and certain moments of kind of uh, intensification of these kind of lines, the way they diverge and, and funnel. And I think it was also quite nice to uh, see this, uh, this building occupied, the kind of streams of people, all in black, all architects at that point, <laughs> harmonizing with the kind of aesthetic and, and really accentuating some of the kind of lines and showing that the, the, the multi-leveledness, the kind of layered of, of the space in all directions above, uh, below uh, and all around um, in this kind of deep um, three-dimensional field space. So you see when they're empty, they're not quite uh, the same uh, as if you kind of have the, have the moving crowds participating and watching each other. It's a center space of, of, of uh, uh, depth, visual depth and simultaneity of communication. And then it becomes, it kind of moves into very, very serene and simple art spaces, gallery spaces, which are nearly kind of neutral. And this is the kind of diagram of, of these kind of um, field of lines kind of uh, irrigating that space and setting up a kind of spatial logic. And that's the way it kind of translates uh, in the real building. And you see the kind of, uh, uh, you see uh, people on different levels. There's actually a cut through here, a glass floor, all the way to the top beam which kind of swings around um, and there's a lot of these kind of deep vistas. Here's a kind of uh, cut all the way to the top level. This is a kind of second singularity or hub of communication in the, in the building the f uh, inside the gallery domain and there's one on the outside um, in the kind of public domain if you like and then it kind of calms down and quiets down and creates this kind of endless flow and it's a space which always continues. There's no beginning, no end, no center. That's this kind of notion of a field where you don't have an object, you, it remains a morph, you're just kind of navigating field qualities, as if you like. Um, and these are this, those moments of kind of depth where you look out and look back at the building and the dif different elements uh, intersecting and you, s uh, and you can kind of anticipate where you might be moving. And this is another one of those kind of complex moments where you see the different elements. Uh, um, you move out of the building to look back through outer space, back into it, etc. There's a lot of these um, 
intricacies of uh, spatial complexity, all based on this rigorous a priori set formalism of, of, of these linear elements which follow certain rules. These are kind of uh, adhered to by, not through a script, but through kind of giving yourself a kind of uh, design rules to follow. These are some of the steps of the terraced kind of gallery, which again you, you reveal to the outside. There's a lot of um, weak intricacy. And now moving up uh, uh, to this space up here. The glass floor was talking about cutting through, looking back over the, over the uh, field and the final kind of moment on the outside. Okay, so just to share that. Um, and that uh, there is importance to distinguish techniques and um, values and descriptions of the results where you're driving the work. In terms of parametricism, um, I'm sh it's a global movement, I think. Um, uh, once I formulate the principles, they're all kind of, there's nothing new. Uh, you recognize them, you recognize them that they're absolutely adhere to and, and become to dominate a whole generation of architects. But I'm showing work only of what, where I'm involved in. I have access to this work, so I did architects, the A Design Research Lab, the Vienna University of Applied Arts, and the Innsbruck Institute of Experimental Architecture. These are some kind of arenas where I'm involved and I'm gathering the work to present, but the implications of this is are obviously wider, and a lot of people here in the room are, I think, participating in that um, in the formation of that style. And, and in fact, to a certain extent, I would say it's a retrospect claim of interpretive authority that there is such a style has been forming over the last 15 years. Um, and so it's a retrospect also kind of reckoning with what has been going on. And uh, it came to me that this is the moment to formulate this position when we had 10 years of DEL retrospective and the realization that what we're working on now, the kind of problems we set ourselves, the ambitions we, we pursue are absolutely identical mm -hmm. to the problems and ambitions we set ourselves over 10 years before that, just we ho had home in at it more deeper, we had built up the reparative techniques to pursue these with more, with more rigor and with more virtuosity, uh, with more domains of application, but the um, the kind of principal ambitions and and and, and were, 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 were remain stable, and that means a lot, given the fact that, for instance, modernism, the whole of the uh, 1920s, the whole decade, kind of forged something which was uh, uh, which was absolutely mature at that point in the late 20s. And I think there is a mature uh, style uh, has been forged. The principles are clear, and I will explicate them now. Just as a reminder that the Digital Cities uh, magazine uh, is the trigger here, and that. Uh, some of this can be followed up in the article, some of the arguments I'm making, and that we're talking about a new global style for architecture and urban design. Um, and the lecture, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to go through all these points. I'm going to start with the definition and principles of parametricism. Um, then I will talk about that relationship between style and techniques which is a general relationship you'll find in the history of architecture. Then we have to go into the historical significance of parametricism within the histories of architecture, but also broader within the history of this uh, civilization we're kind of participating in and to, in a sense, uh, make sense of what's going on, say why it's important, say why it is not, th this economic crisis means very little uh, uh, maybe a small delay, but doesn't prove that this is kind of uh, irresponsible extravagances we're working with, but there is a historical profound significance to the, the kind of work we're pursuing. Then I will just fly through a lot of images documenting the work of Zadid architects within that paradigm. Then I'm trying to, uh, let's say, escalate parametricism uh, the way I see it. Five agendas I've been personally pushing and pursuing and some suggestions for where this work could go and develop. Uh, most of this in the academic arenas of research. And finally, I most will not be able to get to that. I've been recently look at the kind of, let's say we're having a maturing style. I show a lot of work which is adhering to it and I now want to look back and look at the overall history of architecture and see at its absolute high points Gothic Cathedral, Baroque, um, 
uh, churches and see where we are standing with respect to the intricacy level of organization order and um, you know where we uh, how we compete let's say if we would uh, face up to a challenge like this with the buildings we're doing now particularly in Rome it, it kind of th this kind of reflection is triggered when we when we launch a kind of major uh, public building in, in, in a city like this okay so the definition of parametricism is um, not a linguistic definition, it's an operational definition in terms of the do's and don'ts. And um, I will give this the essential definition of innovation just um, on the first on the linguistic level. It means simply that uh, all the elements of architecture have become parametrically malleable. And that's kind of the, the simple statement. That's why we're saying, I use this phrase parametricism to, to uh, um, name what's going on. And we will see that this is what sets it apart from all prior, that's enough to set up what we're doing now apart from all prior architecture of the last uh, 500 years or if you go with 2,000 years. And uh, the striking advantage of this is simply, and that's what it's all about, I think, the intensification of relations, both internal within a building and a construct and of that building within the kind of urban systems. Those internal and external intensification of relations. This, this is what is achieved and can be achieved if we make and assume all architectural elements to be parametric, to be malleable, and therefore, of course, moving into correlations, associative logic, etc. So if you, if you just put that, bring that kind of ontological shift to a point, and I'm saying ontological shift is the really the, 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 the most primary, basic primitives which constitute architecture, what we work with is so radically different. And this image comes straight from Le Corbusier's um, Ver une architecture, where he is describing uh, what architecture constitutes architecture is simply these platonic uh, figures, ideal rigid hermetic geometric figures. That is Rome, but it is also all of modernism is still constituted out of these elements. And that's how you compose. You just uh, repeat these, you, you, you place them into some kind of composition, and that's the game of architecture. And, and what we're now obviously looking at is something radically different. And, and when, when Greg first wrote this article on blobs, you can uh, feel the kind of profundity. There's just, there's a piece of software is bringing into, into, into the domain of architecture and, and uh, it, it gets this kind of ontological weight. Ev everything changes, everything transforms. Um, that is a 95, but we actually already, uh, in terms of parametricist urbanism, if you like, this is a studio project, 93, I've been teaching with um, Zaha Hadid at Columbia University where we have been thinking in terms of layering systems and subsystems and, you know, Chumi made this kind of uh, urknall of, of, of the superposition clear with the la lavillette and, and the next step was in a sense to, that these are not just indifferent to each other and crashing into each other, but that they start to inflect each other and work and pick up each other's uh, geometry, logic, and start to kind of weave into each other the different system and this was a collateral studio where each student would take up one urban layer and then there was a collective process of laying it down, sequencing and letting one layer kind of weave and inflect and mold itself onto the other. And, and, and this is a kind of, these, these are the kind of two, let's say, starting points, I would say, around 93, 95 of what we're now kind of calling parametricism. And the new primitive is obviously instead of a line, there's a spline, something fundamentally different, blobs, nerves, particles and, and scripts as a as a new way, of a new kind of primitive to think through architecture. That is obviously very, very fundamental, and, but it's more than techniques because Fox fosters and lots of late modernists and, uh, use parametric techniques, um, and, and that doesn't participate. It, it, we can learn from that, but it's not pushing, uh, 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 has following the same values and pursuits we, we're promoting, and it's in a sense doing modernist projects with new techniques, or you could also imagine postmodernists or even neoclassicists uh, using and, and, and uh, using um, parametric techniques or computational techniques and develop shaped grammars of, of classical facades, etc. So it's very important to say that we have in, uh, that we, we understand what we're doing as a style, and of course we need to also understand the concept of style is not something superficial about being stylistic and interested only in surface effects but it is something much more profound which transforms the phenomenology, yes, but also the organizational structure of, of uh, architectures and, and urban configurations. It's the great new style after modernism, 
I'm claiming that. And um, it is important to claim this concept of style. I mean, architectural innovation slash history proceeds via the succession of styles. That's the mode in which architecture progresses. And you can parallel with the great kind of paradigms of, of certain sciences, which move through paradigm shifts, and, and each time there's a systematic kind of understanding what's going on. So these are the, the key styles. I call them epochal styles. Gothic, Renaissance, Baroque, Neoclassicism, Historicism, Eclecticism, Modernism, Paramaticism. And in between, there's also could be transitional styles between Renaissance and Baroque. There's mannerism, if you like. They have subsidiary styles. A kind of subsidiary style of the Baroque would be Rococo. Uh, there is, of course, transitions between historicism, eclecticism to modernism, like the Art Nouveau, uh, Expressionism. These are very short-lived, at the moment of crisis, kind of steerings and attempts to find things, in, things new. And then modernism hits home, clears the market. All this Expressionism, near Art Nouveau stuff fades away. And there's 50 years of hardcore pursuit into the same kind of direction, the same principles. And, 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 and that's what we need now, and that's what I feel is forging now. And from modernism to parametricism, we had these kind of transitional episodes like postmodernism and deconstructivism that represent the crisis of modernism, confusion, what to, where to go, what to do, drawing back from history, going all over the place, and bringing in philosophy. I think philosophy comes in to architecture, these moments of crisis and confusion to kind of rethink where we are. And then it kind of, once the, a new kind of paradigm was forged, new values were clear, new ways of working, the philosophy kind of withdraws. And because we have things to do now, and you know what you're doing, you want to just go on with it. And that's what we've, the point we have reached. Uh, um, and nobody's, I mean, I'm great to have Manuel here and to, to guide us further, but the kind of passion to going through Deleuze, the kind of 25th time has faded away we, we, because we know what we're doing. So there's modernism, there's the crisis of modernism, and it's, that is the global phenomenon. That's not internal to architecture. That is the Fordist reproduction paradigm kind of coming to halt, and you can see it with the collapse of the Soviet Union as, as one example, the big kind of crisis of the 70s and, the, and Thatcherism, Reaganism kind of uh, is a huge shift. And that, is, uh, that imposes on architecture to kind of transform itself. You have confusion, you have kind of new things incorporating, and that is kind of, I think now we found our way. That's my interpretation. Um, parametricism is aligned with and is the kind of way forward in terms of a kind of post fordist network society as a new reproduction paradigm. So, and, but there's another significance. I think the way we have to understand style, appearances are important, that you can see that what things look like, and because all what ar of architecture is functioning through sentient subjects who have to understand, comprehend, navigate uh, a phenomenological world, they move through, so appearances are extremely important. So it's, it's, and that's it's no accident. We identify styles through their appearance, um, but of course, the appearance means something much more deeper. It appears and looks a certain way because organized in a certain way and structured in a certain way. Well, that's one important while, while we shouldn't be afraid of uh, style having connotations of how things look like and architects are all about. And that's distinguished from engineering. We are not engineers. We are kind of articulate and, 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 and um, <coughs> work on appearance is extremely important. But also another aspect I think is important to realize that styles have this moment to be kind of design research programs. And what I mean by that, it's very important, particular avant-garde styles. I think in the 20th century, something happened uh, to this one of architecture. It, it kind of bifurcated or it, it created these kind of subsystems of avant-garde and mainstream, <coughs> particular since the 60s have been very, very clear. And um, so that's why we shouldn't be kind of worried that we're still relatively marginal in what we're doing. Uh, there's an avant-garde in which this style becomes hegemonic first, then it conquers the mainstream. And what is important about styles is that they establish the condition for collective design research. And that's what we're feeling, that you know what everybody wants to work on the stuff because everybody else is already working on the stuff and you don't want to work on stuff which, is which nobody wants to know about. You want to participate in something. And that's where things, you progress happens. Yeah? If we kind of critically debate primary principles every Monday morning, we're not going to get anywhere, and the old stuff continues. And as Mies already said, you can't invent a new architecture every Monday morning. You know? And he was quite content, and I'm content to, to work on this uh, with these kind of principles for the next uh, 
25 years. So, but it is about formulating pertinent desires, and we come to this, the kind of values, a kind of Kunstwollen, if you like, uh, framing and posing problems, problems we all work on, problems we all want to solve. You know, how to move from single system setups to multiple system setups, and how to, how to kind of, uh, uh, like use, you know, like integrate um, generative systems, uh, agent modeling systems with, 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 with preconceived setups, et cetera. So these are, there's some problems we're all working on, and of course, strategically constraining the solution space. Um, that means when we're facing um, uh, architectural problems, urban problems, when we're setting a brief and task, we know we're only gonna solve it through parametric systems. We're only gonna solve it through single surfaces, et cetera. We're not gonna f allow ourselves to fall back on discrete objects, on, uh, a number of a given things. So, so there's clearly a, the necessary for any collective research project to go forward is that we are, we are bloody-minded and focused. And on it's extremely important to hold on to the new principles of fermenting in the face of difficulty. So a lot of the stuff which have been, been working on seems kind of inept, seems kind of unable to stand up to the real realities. You have to withdraw into the gallery, you do your experiments, you have to disburden yourself. So a lot of this is then you kind of start to uh, tackle an urban issue, you, you enter uh, a competition, you lose all of them first. So it's extremely important that you're not disheartened, that you keep homing in because your intuition is, it is these principles, these a priori, these kind of things I'm holding on to obstinately because my intuition is, in the end I will succeed, in the end I will be winning and being hyper-performative and will outperform the modernists, the deconstructivists, the neoclassicists because I'm more versatile, I'm more intelligent, I can integrate more uh, aspects, et cetera, and so I'm winning out, and we are winning out at the moment, I will say. But this is very important, and you can compare this to uh, the paradigms uh, of science, where when they're first forged and fermented, you know, they're continuously uh, uh, defeated and, 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 and weak, but they need, you need this kind of methodical tolerance to allow these uh, early and budding research programs to kind of continue in the face of failure, difficulty, ridicule. But I think there's also an important point where we, I think we've reached where we also have to gear up. We cannot kind of, that kind of zone of tolerance cannot continue forever. I don't think it continue into the second and third uh, decade without, without being discredited. And I had that intuition early on in the design research that where I wanted to challenge the, these new techniques, ways of working, and and formalisms and, and bring them hardcore tasks to solve and show their high performance uh, capacity. For instance, um, business organizations and uh, corporate uh, uh, headquarters and so on, the kind of high performance aspects of society can be, you deliver the high performance spaces to them with these means. Um, so what are, and, 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 and the way to define a kind of paradigm or research program is to a so-called heuristics. The kinds of um, um, issues and paths of research you avoid, you're no longer trying to solve a problem, for instance, uh, in, in a modernist way or in a kind of classicist way. You, you just this, These paths are blocked and you have an intuition which kind of uh, working hypotheses are the ones you want to pursue and you just pursue them, pursue them, pursue them. These are the, 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 the heuristics, both negative and positive, what to avoid and what to always set as a a priori method to work tasks through. So, and, but also when, when I started to think about it, I focused foremost on the formal heuristics and I will show these formal heuristics, but I think there's also functional heuristics. That each style has not only a certain formal repertoire which you can recognize, but it has also actually a certain way of understanding and handling programs and functions. And that, that, that is an important reflection and it must be so um, because um, the dis distinction of form and function is critical and form function relations remain critical at the center of this discipline. If there is a series of paradigm shifts as styles evolve where everything seems to change, one thing never changes. It is the integration that you have, that we are all about to innovate form function relationships and give new form to new function. Um, therefore, we have to think about funct both functional heuristics and formal heuristics, which in the end define parametricism. And I can also, in the same way, define modernism, define neoclassicism, define the Baroque, define the Renaissance, and the book David is talking about is trying to do that. Here I'm focusing on parametricism. So the formal 
heuristics, the things are, which are more in our face and obvious are very simple and, and there's nothing um, um, ob <laughs> new about this. As I, as I hinted at before, negatively no rigid forms. I mean, who is still drawing a circle, square, rectangle? I mean, everybody here in the front row, their arms would rather fall off than, you know, allow that to happen. So that is the artificiality. <laughs> you, you simply don't do it. And they, you, you don't even question it anymore. I mean, but, but it's, uh, it, you ha it has to be like this. Because if you allow that, then you kind of hybridize and electrize your, 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 and you cannot s test a thesis. A thesis is you can do it without using this. So these are absolutely out. Why? They lack complexity. They, they, they lack capacity of relating. And there's a main, so. <laughs> That's the first. Um, the second is no repetition. And we know that. I mean, of course, uh, some allowance uh, is made on in, in perhaps in a tessellation, yes, but in an overall kind of composition, to have repetition is absolutely taboo. And it should be so. An interesting thing is that architecture has always worked with these platonic families and always relied on repetition from the classical to the modern. And now we're also saying this is kind of the arch image of Fordist modernism, where repetition in the urban, repetition and in, 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 in the architectural, in, in, in on every level, to the, to the last tectonic detail. And there's a lack of variety, and that's no longer representing the society. The society uh, you know, can no longer find itself in there. It can no longer structure and artic organize and articulate society. So that is also out. <laughs> but also, no pure difference. I mean, this was a big discussion when, you know, difference was drawn in postmodernism, you know, collage, collage city, and deconstructivism kind of integrating and, and, and breaking into each other, different systems which remain in conflict and so on. I mean, that idea of pure difference, we've gone over that. I mean, that was a big kind of uh, achievement of the early 90s with, with Greg and Jeff and so on, and, and making that very, very clear. So there is no pure difference, no collage of unremelted elements. And, but what we're striking out, there's lack of order in this. And what, but what we're striking out here is actually everything which is going on ever since the crisis of modernism, the collapse of modernism. What we're getting now all over the world, all developed model, is this pure difference, is that unrelated cacophony of, of things placed. And there is no relate, relatedness from, from one building to the next, from one quarter to, urban quarter to the next. There is no from one room to the next in, in these compositions. So, so it's, it's blinding. It's chaos. It's visual chaos. And there's no, no, no rhyme, reason, or navigability and orientability in this. So all of this is going. What, you know, the, the ideology of architecture for the last 2,000 years, the reality of, of the last 30 years, all of this is negated. And but. You know, we know where we're going. Where we're going is, I mean, the big inspiration comes from nature. We have gearing up. I and mean, nature was always, in a sense, that dream, that, 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 that um, sense what architecture aspires to. It was just differently interpreted. I mean, the classic architecture was rep constructing itself as a representation of nature, understanding itself in terms of proportion and order and, and kind of cosmic models and so on. Modernism was 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 in, and Sharon uh, and, and Herring and but also Frank Lloyd and everybody was kind of relating to nature. Nature, but now I think comparing to the models of nature delivered by classicism, modernism, we truly on a totally different new level with a new understanding of nature through dynamical systems and 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 a new understanding of ma material self-organization. We have finally uh, uh, kind of another uh, access to nature, which is delivering exactly what the three crosses kind of uh, uh, were motivated by, complex variegated order. And these are the kind of emerging things find. That's what we want to, these uh, cities, these landscapes, these kind of spaces to be like. There's kind of coherency and there's va va variation, but following laws and logics um, in organic, anorganic nature, etc. So, And the only precursor of parametricism is in fact for order who has been kind of taken as extremely serious, and I was just discussing earlier with Manuel that the kind of institute uh, with all these kind of analog computing um, and research and then into computing is something which is amazingly dense and deep and we cannot replicate. None of us here being isolated with a bunch of students uh, have hazardly kind of individual efforts cannot replicate in a sense what 
what a kind of research institute with a kind of stable tenure, multiple peoples over, over a long period of time is able to deliver. And it's still extremely important to go to these research pro, uh, reports. It's a great resource and it makes us reflect that architecture doesn't have any research, institutionalized research, except for the exception. So what we are forced to do is to transform teaching institutions into kind of vehicles of research, but with all their limitations every year, new students, or avant-garde firms using their haphazard uh, sequence of projects to, to forge an oeuvre. And only very, very recently we have in, corp in firms kind of very, very small research unit happening. So, but it seems to me that the kind of ambitions we're formulating needs a new institutional rec recognition in terms of research uh, institutes which don't exist. And, but what in terms of nature and the kind of learning from nature, uh, of course, it's wonderful what Ferdo is doing, but we, are, we can go much further. I mean, we're applying this, we're winning competitions in, in, in different city plans. And, 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 uh, but um, so uh, there, there is something happening at Zadid Architects. There's these kind of things being forged and, and developed at AADRL. Um, Vienna, even Innsbruck, a provincial city, I mean, it doesn't matter where you go. Once you, you deliver the message, you set out the tools, it's kind of happening, it's, it's, it's coming on. Um, and the wonderful thing for me is that it is in fact, compared to for Otto, we are, we are so much more kind of freed and, and, and proliferous because the nature we are creating is truly second, is truly original creation, artificial life. <laughs> As if you if you like, um, um, where we where we're not constrained in terms of design by um, the, the the few physical processes we find. If we create a swarm, we don't have to have all the the fish of uh, uh, about the same. We can make a swarm which is differentiated with different individuals, which nature never produced, creating kind of swarm formation, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm defending this, the kind of artificiality of this as a design project. Because on the one hand, we have Fre Otto as moving into kind of developing structures. He can optimize them through analog models as structures. There is another layer with an architecture where I want to have these organically, int intricately correlated and deep and awesome kind of compositions, not because they're only, only because they're high performance and because they they, 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 they really deliver the most efficient kind of structural uh, performance, but I'm, I'm also craving for this as a kind of articulation and as an artistic project which, which, which n allows us to navigate these complex spaces. So there is a kind of um, articulatory project where I can use a lot of this artificial nature to create wonderfully navigable and, and highly organized uh, spaces where, which, uh, which are not necessarily about their physical performance. That it's about the kind of social communication performance, if you like. And that's why the artificiality is important. Um, okay, we had, this is the way parameters of stuff looks like. That's where it gets in some in, in, um, uh, inspiration from in terms of uh, natural uh, analogs. And if you want to bring it to, coin it down into three slogans, I mean, I had three negative slogans. I also create three positive slogans. Uh, principal parameters. And the first one is, these are called just the kind of opposites, the, the uh, soft forms. Um, and of course, we, we, we use these kind of blobs, nerve surfaces as primitives, and, 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 and there's a whole kind of, each of them creates a whole kind of range of, of elements within a species. So we have that, but we, we, we have, um, and we apply this to all uh, design um, aspects, not only architecture. And more importantly, this, these soft forms, of course, I can have embedded intelligence. Uh, it could be structural performance, it could be other uh, aspect, environmental responsiveness, et cetera. So that's, uh, that is a, another aspect, and we're always craving for that and always uh, aim for that. But I also leave the kind of just the pure form, soft form as a kind of articulatory artistic project. And it's not necessarily only about um, the kind of um, hardcore performance. So soft forms, intelligent soft forms. 
the first uh, positive principle. The next one is, um, so always start with soft forms and assume parametric elements. The second one is uh, always differentiate. And differentiation and um, this whole kind of uh, world of uh, setting up generative components and differentiating the surface, thinking through um, genotypes and let them proliferate and respond to phenotypical uh, conditions, of course, is extremely important. That moment of differentiation or from element to element and then creating a kind of field of continuous differentiation which you can follow and understand. And, and that's a kind of moment of ad adaptation, of course extremely important everybody knows these these techniques and everybody would all it was important to to say that um uh, so differentiation uh, you can kind of pick up on environmental parameters or you just simply want to accentuate and differentiate the surface because you want to allow different social events to happen along and uh, within that surface so it's not necessarily always has to be tied to um, um, let's say engineering type parameters and this differentiation is uh, is intelligent as well and this is just an example of a recent project we won in, in Beijing where you just take the uh, engineering software um, and you, 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 you measure the light distribution over the year and then you just allow that to drive a kind of, for instance, a Louvre script, uh, densify, densify accordingly. These are kind of, uh, these are the point of triviality already assumed as, as, as the natural way of working we would no longer allow ourselves to just apply a kind of generic louver system. It, would, it will have to go through the a kind of intelligent scripting process. And uh, the epiphany for me was when I, when I, when I saw the kind of GCs uh, and this population of components on the surface emerging, I said, oh wow, you could also, you don't have to just, these are not necessarily only facade panels kind of adapting to a complex geometry. This could be whole buildings as components populating uh, the uh, the landscape, and that that's the epiphanic moment, the foundation, let's say, of what I at that moment called parametric urbanism as a paradigm, and now I call parametricist urbanism, if you like. But uh, um, the the third and most most important um, principle or heuristic principle of parametrism is that you would always seek out for correlations, and I think you mentioned kind of denigrated with associative modeling is this is just kind of I think that's the heart for me that's the kind of thing where it's where it's at and I'm not necessarily privileging just, just the, the, the emergent uh, the generative out of its own I think uh, this is kind of a source material and what we really have to do is forge correlations be creative inventive about core setting up correlations between everything and everything uh, from everything to from, from 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 local to global from layer to layer from from build inside to outside from urban to architectural, that's where the game is. And that's why we need malleable uh, elements, that's why we need to differentiate finally to correlate. And that for me, the epidemic moment was this, when I first heard the, the word scripting in, 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 in the domain of architecture at the DRL in the 90s, where uh, uh, a responsive environment paradigm, where we said, okay, you can set this up and, and any parameter of any object, position, shape, color, reflectivity, can be correlated with any parameter object aspect of any number of other elements and it's, it's just an infinite universe of possibility of stitching up the association that's where it is that's the heart that's the core and it could also be um, you know and the systems could be absolutely divergent I'm interested that you have totally radically different ontologies and you make resonances you you set up correlations and it means that the tower hits doesn't hit the ground dead it does something, there's a kind of repercussion, resonance, there's action at distance as well, but there's also this pro proximate um, aspect. Here we're correlating shape of tower with facade uh, component, if from retail to office to residential. Um, it's, it's always this association. And of course, in terms of techniques of associative modeling, um, we're getting there as well. We, we, the ideas we have, we can design them, we don't necessarily need to be geared up so, so well, but to really implement it, uh, you know, you can see all these elements and you see a lot of components are, are drawn together and, 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 and recognize each other and, and, and the element becomes, it goes through a serious move and everything follows through. This is just a kind of very, very generic setup and I criticize there's, there's, there's a lot of repetition <laughs> here still going on and um, but this is just the beginning of a kind of tower research we're, we're doing where we, it's all about the correlation of, mul of the subsystems within the structure resonating with each other. Interarticulation of 
multiple subsystems. That's that's the key. That's where we where we have to go. And that's why I said to Mark, you know, move from single system to multiple system, and and also please come back to architecture. L you know, use these galleries. I mean, that's you know, as vehicles to get resources, but but uh, but come back to architecture. We need you. So this is the um, one of those DRL projects where it is about correlating subsystems about and then also when I see the kind of transcoding with some of the things like Casey was doing from one to the other, I want to see all the different versions of a transcoded da data set having the many lives to be there simultaneity, not switch from one to the other. But I like to, architecture is, is, is not a single kind of system. It's so many subsystems, so many materials, so many strata coming together and they need to be all coincided and orchestrated. Uh, in, in, in the artifact, and that's where the heart of parametricism lies. So, so this is where, of course, you start out the tower, there's a kind of lattice structure. Of course, you differentiate along the vertical axis. In the end, you differentiate along the uh, circumference. You give it a bit of a twist to see what happens to, to, to allow the differentiation to, to radiate through the structure. Then you take a kind of network script to, to kind of recognize the initial differentiation. Uh, and, and you, you kind of amplify. For me, the key is the kind of the amplification of an initial differentiation through a second layer, the accentuation, which makes it also more legible, transparent, and it makes sense with the kinds of uh, structural efficiency, but as architects, we are, we are really interested in the, then you can set thresholds, not only always about kind of gradients, you can arbitrary threshold, solid void. Then you, comes in the next subsystem, there's already kind of a structured, uh, uh, structural shell, the, the floor systems, and they respond to uh, the way the, the, the curvature applies. You pull back with the floor at that point, and you do that uh, with, with more complexity. Every kind of, um, of these uh, uh, empty places now pulls, allows the slab to pull back. Simple rules of station. Then we come in with a structure and, and it's important that these, the, the, these subsystems kind of com, come together and the tower is the ideal vehicle for it because that's such a rigid typology. You know what the systems, subsystems are. It's tight, it's not going everywhere and it's, it's a tight body you can kind of work through. So we have this diagram and then we're saying equidistant setup of the points for the ribs. You pull them back and then what you see is that the, 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 the position of the core, the asymmetric position of the core implies that with, uh, combined with the equidistant projection back of the ribs, that here you have very wide spacing where it's close, very uh, dense spacing where it's far. So the distance of the core to its perimeter drives the density and you have a kind of local recognition when you, in a zone of dense uh, uh, ribs, you know that you're far away from the perimeter at the point. You also make the rib deeper every aspect kind of has a repercussion It becomes, there's a lot of local to global inferences and these correlations you also feel there is something going on, something means, it's not just clobbered together, things are not indifferent, they all recognize each other, respond to each other and that creates this awesome beauty where you want to, where you, and, and we have this, I think in terms of aesthetic sensibilities, a lot of this culturally prof uh, kind of f formed, but there's also something very deep, deep where you're never curious about a spilled garbage uh, can because there is no order organization. You can kick it and, and nothing matters, nothing makes a difference. But here you, 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 there's this kind of awesome recognition that everything is in its place, everything works together, it's correlated, interrelated. And that's, that's a kind of very, very powerful, I think, also aesthetic paradigm. And you can navigate it. You know everything makes sense. You can follow the correlations through and know where you, where you want to be and where kind of events might settle. Then you can, um, um, this is just details of the kind of solid void is then kind of ameliorated again with another component placed on top. And then when you kind of come in, you get, and this is just a student project, um, you, 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 you get a sense of things kind of make sense, come together, there's an orchestration of radically different ontologies and systems, and that's what I insist on. Uh, but they kind of, you feel there's a kind of radiating uh, cross orchestration, uh, which, which, which is beauty. So to, just to summarize, the principle of parametricism and it's important that these are, okay, the negative principle, no rigid forms, no simple repetition, no collage of isolated, unrelated elements, positively all so forms soft and intelligently soft so that deformation becomes information, all systems differentiated and all systems correlated. Now, these are not just kind of, um, they're, they're dogmas 
taboos and dogmas because we're not going to do anything else. We know that. But at the same time, there are tools of criticism and project development, project enhancement. When you teach, you can always identify. There are still rigid forms here. You can work on these and make them soft. There are still elements of repetition. Overcome this. You still haven't, and there's, there's more to be differentiated. There's more to cover. It's an infinite, endless job which can only boost and develop the project further. Every new project, you can kind of up the game and and that's the way I teach. It's just so that easy. There's, there's the, the lines of progress are plotted out. You could, and you, you have always intelligent design work to do. Of course, coming up with the ideas of which kind of function I should script, what I can correlate with what and how, and how it, it, that's where the creativity is. But right? you can always send the student back and you know correlate these. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's 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 absolutely fail safe and it's important. And, and when he comes back with the correlation, it is it is. It is definitely enhancing the project. So this is, these are the operational uh, definition of parameters. And to somehow, I mean, it's, it's inevitable. We know it's, we, 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 it's exactly what we're doing. And why are we doing this? What is the advantage? It's of course, the intensity of relations which, which are created, internal integration within the building and external adaptation. As, as no, if we build no longer like the modernists, we no longer build this tower and plunk it there, of course we have to seek out um, um, adaptations, affiliations, hopefully multiple affiliations all around, and that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, performance game, that's the kind of race. And it's very clear that, um, that's, that, 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 that what, what the criticisms and uh, um, what the ambitions of the project will be in terms of, for instance, contextualism. And this is kind of, and the power of that, that we, we are able, and no deconstructors, postmodernists, ne modernists, neoclassicists can take, and that's why we win competitions, can take a kind of existing fabric, pick it all up, affiliate to it, let it participate, and radically deliver new, larger sites, bigger buildings, open places, etc. I mean, this is just a, a simple diagram. And in terms of internal integration, I reuse this image. Functional heuristics, I mean, there is something, and I have to bring it in, it's the first time I kind of talk about this, it's not in the article, uh, is also to be looked at. We have a different way of conceiving functions. Uh, negatively, we're no, we no longer, we're avoiding now typological reduction to generic or essentializing functional designations. You know, we, we don't have these kind of rigid stereotypes and say this is the living room or this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the lecture theater, which is a single function, a single relatedness, encapsulated. I mean, that's no longer what we what we do. Um, uh, positively, we are we are want to think about if you get a brief about variable social scenarios calibrated by multiple event parameters, etc. We have a different conception of what it is: actor, uh, uh, artifact, networks, etc. So I don't have time to go into detail with it, but there's definitely a different way of functional heuristics, a different way of working up the brief and, and, in, and setting out the, the, the issues uh, when we approach this as parameterist architects. Okay, now, I, you know, the techniques are extremely important. I mean, everybody here has to recognize, I think I disagree with Marcus saying that you should go to the biology department. No, you have to learn and acquire, you have to bring yourself up to the, to the level of your discipline and participate, so the techniques are extremely important and you have to crack them, learn them, expand them, and, and otherwise you cannot participate. That's a, a precondition now, but it's not all. I mean, there is a dif distinction between parametrism and parametrics, and that's the image I like to use. It's been laudated as the first project which used, and you, yes, it's true, every node is different, every element is different in that form, but architecturally, it wants to deny th this differentiation of the surface, that the surface has a different orientation, a different <laughs> uh, curvature, you know. So, so here it's a parametric techniques in the service of um, neutralizing difference, right? So it's inconspicuous neutralization of differences. That's what fosters here. To any, and and uh, in the end, architect, on the terms of values, it's, he wants to solve that complex geometry like that. He is still Miesian. And I love this. I mean, that's what, what you want to do. You know, you want to, and, and that's the difference. 
That's the kind of Kunst one, but it also makes much more sense in contemporary society. You want to have the conspicuous amplification of differences. You have the surface definition, you celebrate it, and, you, and I love this because it has these kind of the parallel ribs, it has the, the regular grid, and then it becomes kind of dense and, 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 and intricate, and, and it, it modulates between all these. And you can imagine that, that different event scenarios will settle, that it's got a much more richer and variegated space rather than that big kind of um, neutralizing kind of envelope. So, so that's what we're what we after, and that's the difference between parametrics and parametricism. So the emphasis is on differentiation, deviation, amplification, rather than neutralizing compensation. So, and there's also this whole thing, I think we have to recognize that architecture is different from engineering. Somebody mentioned, interesting, you had that, I, I think Mark's idea was quite nice about the kind of problem-solving attitude and the kind of problem-formulating, ambition-generating attitude. And that's, that's the difference, and I'm, and I'm, I'm all to say explorative design research. Of course, we also need to solve problems, and we use engineers for that, or ourselves. <coughs> and a lot of the coding in the end might be kind of specialist engineers uh, brought in, or, um, and uh, versus problem solving, implementation. That, that, there is quite a, quite a bit of difference between tonic design and facade engineering. Which means that tonic design, it's important appearances, the legibility, the, the, the how, how the, how the, um, how this, uh, the facade articulation at this point resonates with the totality of, of, of facades in that whole zone. So it's not a technical problem. And, and you harness technological efficiencies and you heighten them to become articulatory means. Um, and that's the difference between architecture and engineering. And you have to, and we have to emphasize these disciplines are different autopoistic systems of communications, which are in fact incommensurable. And avant-garde designs, I mean, was, I'm, in that's, uh, that's also hits into this. The, a lot of what we're doing is still in the stage of hypotheses. You can kind of, you're not yet competing uh, benchmark kind of level of, of competition. We can't stand it yet. Well, there are some projects I would say we can. And there are manifestos. Uh, you know, they, they don't have to hyper-perform in the, their promises of, of a higher performance. They not necessarily perform better where and uh, where they're employed. Like the Rietfeld house of uh, Schroeder house from, from Rietfeld was not the best single family house. It was a manifest of a new kind of spatial sensibility. And that has to be recognized. And one more time in terms of this, um, 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 yes, we're saying it's, it solved everything through scripting, even if you don't have to. It's not about the pragmatics of getting <laughs> things done. <laughs> it's about forcing the discipline through that track. So the a priori of techniques in the architectural research is not about the best way of doing it. It is the, maybe initially the most difficult things to do it, but you have to do it this way because there's a learning curve there to be garnered. So, but <laughs> styles and design media have always been in an interesting dialectic. And I'm saying the Renaissance, in fact, interestingly, although I think Gothic produced some architecture, the discipline of architecture, <coughs> emerges in the Renaissance because it's, a, the, it's the kind of conscious reflection and criticism with theoretical texts and reinvention of architecture. And it comes together with a new medium of speculation sp perspective. Um, I think the Baroque is a kind of dialectic uh, movement with, with projective geometry, modernism, exonometry, where you suddenly can just roll out these infinite arrays of space and, but, I mean, you can see this is kind of harmless. This is really monumental in terms of the, the shift, <laughs> right? So, so we have to expect monumental changes. And this is just another thing, I mean, uh, what, what struck me, I mean, this, uh, it's the utilization of digital design, universe to design a world with its own creative laws, logic, and association. This is a kind of recreating quasi laws of nature. Um, um, uh, creation of new species, new complex order with new beauty. I mean, that, that, that's the world. I mean, it's, it's just staggering. Uh, and and um, in terms of grasping that, the freedom, the creative freedom which, which there is. And that's why it doesn't matter. It's so rich and infinite that you can give that corset of the taboos and dogmas because within there is so much richness and, and th there's so much, um, and you don't need to kind of be eclectic and it's not kind of totalitarian. It, it is it within itself. It's actually the first kind of style who, who has an enormous variegation within itself, 
while you have to toe the line, the, the taboos and dogmas stand. Now, in terms of history of parametricism is at the same time, of course, the history of architecture and the history even of humanity, the world civilization, if you like. It's embedded, of course. Um, and to, to step back, I mean, um, and give a kind of deeper, long-term perspective of the role of architecture in, I would say, in the uh, emergence of humanity as a new kind of species in this world is critical and crucial. Um, there is no way, I mean, um, that society becomes together with architecture. I mean, that's, that's for me a given. I mean, social order requires spatial order. Architecture provides a long-term social memory as a necessary substrate of evolution. I think there's, there's no way that, I mean, let's say the, the kind of flock of apes becomes human through, it needs the kind of new evolutionary substrates, the permanence of settlement structures. It needs to also artificially order itself through kind of manipulating its, its, its physiognomy and so on. So there's a, there's a whole thing there about, um, and I'm just uh, going through, but very, very quickly, um, kind of different stages of civilization and the, and the kind of architectures which sponsor and sustain these kind of uh, these civilizations and that with each kind of new level system comes a kind of totally new architecture which with, a, with a new uh, phenomenology. So you have these kind of uh, early villages and you have the crystallization of cities in an agricultural landscape. It's a huge jump, of course, in, in terms of feudalism and there are certain organs which are, which are kind of created and accrued and, of course, the, the, these, at this point, these kind of um, structures kind of grow slowly through trial and error in an unconscious kind of tr traditional process, but there, there's always the same kind of organs. These are the moments of, of the trade and, and exchange and the crystallization of a, hand, a specialized handicraft in a kind of agricultural society. And these, if you look at the, at the map of Europe during the, in the Middle Ages, you have kind of thousands of dots of these smaller cities, equidistant, more or less in the landscape, crystalling out like little kind of bacteria hubs, if you like. There's a kind of near naturalness about this process. And all cities, uh, whether it was uh, uh, from the Paris to the, to the smallest one at the beginning, they were all sa the same size. They're always these, the, you know, the marketplace, the handicraft streets, and the, and the church, and the wall around it. Um, th that was the, the organs, I mean, which developed. And then comes this kind of big bang of the Renaissance, where you, what has been growing, and let's say that the round form of the city is just the, the, the simple law of efficiency of circumference and so on. It's a nearly quasi-trial-error material process, animal-like nearly of the, of the early architectures. And then you have the kind of big bang of architecture as a conscious discipline which draws these things out, the separation of drawing from, from, uh, from building. And then, of course, the initial ideal cities are just representations of the medieval town. And then, but then it kind of, history accelerates drastically and fast. Your perspective comes out and you can speculate and this is kind of settling in a series of ideal Renaissance cities and then comes the uh, moment of the Baroque where, you know, 200 years later where this kind of order, consciously planned and structured order of the city which was confined within the city and the rest was kind of terra ignognita, uh, amorphous hinterland, this order of the city is now kind of thrust outwards, cut out, and the, and, the, and the landscape and nation state, there's roads built, canals cut, um, um, uh, the kind of, uh, that's the moment of uh, Louis XIV, the, uh, the national economy, et cetera, the moment of the Baroque, or Baroque city plan. And then I'm just jumping, just to give a few <laughs> hints. Um, um, and, and there's interesting aspects about Baroque architecture being able to, with its um, devices of convex, concave asymmetry in the detail, creating a more stronger symmetry in the overall compared to the more additive composition of the Renaissance, the Baroque architecture can grasp and integrate larger structures into an integrative whole than and the Renaissance. And then you have, I'm just jumping ahead, uh, um, the kind of mechanical 
uh, uh, repetition of, of modernism and in industrial uh, society. And what it generates is two things. It generates a kind of the endless repetition on the one hand of, 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 of products, of, of elements, and it creates a kind of complex uh, organization which works through separating out radically different. You see, these are so different from here, each of them different, but within total repetition. And you can show that in a lot of them. It's something new, but within repetition. So it's a kind of zoning, separating out, um, keeping the relationships minimal. Every institution in the building is like this, the different wings. The Bauhaus, look at it. Each segment separated out for special function, the freedom to have different floor height, depths, and so on, so, and then the minimal connection. So there's kind of separation and repetition as a kind of uh, organizational paradigm of modernism. But you find the same. I can do the same kind of principles I've done for paramedicine for modernism, and it just, just it's, it's rips through. It just changes the face of this globe uh, uh, within uh, in a few decades, and and that's a, such a successful uh, uh, um, reproduction paradigm. And, and modern architecture was the aligned answer to that, and it got into crisis in the 70s. Doesn't mean that this was a was a mistake at the time. This delivered a new level of material plenty and, and, and a new level of freedom. And the, the whole of the architectural of the international style is kind of, uh, can be read as a kind of high performance answer to, to a Fordist reproduction paradigm. And of course, that at a certain moment, that goes into crisis and, and, and there's a kind of switch and, and a new kind of um, way to go. There's a first, the moment of crisis come, shows up in kind of ironic dystopian visions then shows up in kind of back to history and kind of confusion. Um, kind of experiment, wild experimentation. Uh, in, in, and, and then the kind of uh, new kind of ordering principles. And early on with Zaha also kind of vision that whatever we're working on would, would kind of transform again the, the, the face of the planet. And then we are kind of finally arriving at winning with these principles large uh, projects. So, and also just a reminder of that that early on I realized that, that this work is powerful and means something. There's an enormous, in interestingly, alignment of 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 the um, uh, concepts and, and 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 desires of of uh, parametricism at the time called folding, which was so much aligned with corporate. Uh, organization principles, in a sense, um, partaking in, in, a, in a kind of global paradigm shift that also uh, relates to the sciences, to political structures, etc. Anyway, these are some of these uh, early projects of, and it's important to mention that these were uh, an idea to tackle corporate organization of kind of three-dimensional bureau landscapes, high-performance spaces by definition, and we were able to, with the BMW plan, to bring that into reality, to convince BMW that their kind of central administration building should not be another of these blocks on the side, but should sit in the right and in the heart of it. Yet we, you kind of funnel all communications, you mix functions, and you create a kind of int intricate kind of uh, uh, field space, open space, and with a high, strong formal priori, similar to Rome project, this kind of everything kind of subjected and, and brought under the spell of the kind of line geometries flying through. But in the end, the kind of thing which functions and works and, and performs on a high level better than a modernist solution would, would have been. So here we're arriving at, um, at, 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 at win gaining confidence and, 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 and demonstrating the, the, the capacity of this new way of working. And, and I can extrapolate this again in terms of the space, in terms of the, um, the, the, the sensibilities, to, not, to, to look at the interior, the kind of deep layering, the simultaneity of, 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 of participation uh, at the same time, a kind of rich differentiation of, of a scene. These are the kind of things which, which I think sustain contemporary society, network society. Just to go through it very quickly in a kind of run through. So we have this kind of medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, modernism, postmodernism, deconstructivism. But each of them only a decade, which is nothing. Uh, and we are already kind of 15 years in with, you know, Parametricism. So, so that's that's my kind of theory of, of, of where we are and, and, and what we're what we're doing. 
and um, yeah, the idea of epochal styles uh, versus transitional styles and subsidiary styles. Subsidiary, for instance, in, in modernism, you had the white modernism, then came brutalism, then came kind of high tech. They, they, they're kind of styles, but they're subsidiary. They're under the paradigm of modernism. And we're talking about an epochal new style, which will have many, many subsidiary styles. It's also, I think, the first style we can, uh, which might have in the, even fashions within it. It's like the international style, but much more. It's truly global. There can no longer be any national regional architectures, I believe. But it has the inherent capacity of local adaptation, which modernism had didn't have to, to the same extent. So, so there's a number of things one can kind of think through and um, it's no fashion itself, but within itself it has fashion. That, that has to be also clear that this is a, a, an, an unbelievable profundity. And uh, what it does is it organizes and articulates the social complexity of post this network society. But this post the next network society is it happening, it's kind of happening through socioeconomic restructuring and economic dynamics, it's happening through political dynamics. We are just faced with this and deal with it and translate that. We are not substituting ourselves for, ourselves for the politics which is, which is coming on. And I'm therefore not so keen on those who kind of try to substitute actually for politics like Ronald Martin, these kind of critical kind of, uh, we have to draw the conclusions and, and deliver the, um, the, um, the architecture for this, for these ongoings. And there's a lot of progressive elements in these transformations. So now I'm taking too much time, but I'm gonna fly through, and it's quite important, through the Zaha Hadid architects uh, uh, contributions to, th to this. Uh, these were maybe still kind of deconstructivist translating into parametricism, uh, fully kind of um, um, uh, malleable and, and intricate structure of Wolfsburg. We can, it's, and it's so rich and variegated. We, the repertoire, everything is parametricist, everything is kind of malleable and, and differentiated, but we have different conceptual morphologies, different ways of, 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 of classifying and ordering the work according to these. Um, so it's a very, very rich and infinitely rich world compared to, to modernism. Of course, lots of blobs and and in all these domains, we, we create these kind of families of, of, of projects. Um, um, fields are extremely, extremely important in terms of the urbanism, uh, continuously differentiating fields, and different examples. And, and, um, and the interarticulation also of urbanism and architecture is very important, physical planning, and the ability to, to, to deliver both at the same time. Urbanism, urban design, architecture, uh, even interiors and details, and one kind of unified, uh, correlated, resonating uh, um, process. So there's a sl slogan of total fluidity on all scales. Urbanism is where it all comes together, but it's important to recognize that we're doing all scales and all programs now, like modernism. Modernism, for the first time, universalized architecture. Before that, architecture was the preserve of institutional buildings, churches, palaces, particular buildings, and then it was still the kind of unthought vernacular. Modernism, for the first time, claims universal relevancy and competency. And that is not only for urbanism, architecture, it's also for interior design, for product design, for all design. It's one unified discourse, and I'm claiming the same authority, so what we're doing here will affect everything everywhere. There's a kind of total uh, universal claim and exclusive competency of the discourse of architecture for the totality of all artifactual production in this world. <laughs> and that starts with urbanism, when it's you know, if, if this discourse is hegemonic here, it will, it will ripple and rip through everything and transform everything. Like modernism, look at the Bauhaus, look at the furniture, the products, everything was, was transformed in its image. And so we're doing, uh, we're doing large urban projects, we're doing institutional uh, clusters, we're doing sports uh, uh, projects, um, we're doing museums, of course, and most of them are cultural buildings, cultural special public buildings, because that's where there's a bit more space for manifestos, where the kind of performance criteria are a little bit more, more loose, uh, performing arts in Guangzhou. And um, I'll just click through that stuff. 
and everywhere the, the principles assume a kind of single surface modulating, uh, bringing together um, um, uh, seating, uh, lighting gantries, etc. And the, the look at nature sometimes kind of, uh, yeah, more inspired by kind of formal formations. Uh, a lot of these kind of uh, uh, inspirations and transformations. But a lot of these are um, competition wins and so on, as I said, for cultural buildings, kind of. Uh, The project in Amman, for instance, for national theater. And everywhere there's a kind of a desire for uh, simultaneity of space unfolding below, above, all around, integrating with the landscape, with the, with the urban, um, uh, having kind of thinking through meaningful relationships between exterior and interior, a new Guggenheim Museum. Uh, a new uh, cultural center which combines uh, museum, library, and conference center, and we generate a whole kind of urbanism around this, and the landscape around this, and it's on site as well. And importance, the interior, the in integration of exterior and interior, the kind of co connections and differentiation, then the kind of flow from one space to another. This is a, a First one was a museum, then we're moving to the library, moving to the um, uh, conferencing area at Tripoli. Um, actually, it's a uh, People's Congress, a uh, new potential museum here in America. Um, a lot of these um, uh, institutional uh, cultural buildings as hubs of communication and as always a kind of, they're all different, they're all unique, they're, they're embedded in a context, they're kind of multifaceted. Um, a, a recent one in Casablanca, there's an interest in, in penetrating exterior and interior, um, bleeding out to, 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 to structure public space around it. Um, uh, National Library of Astana, again interior is very important. Um, Beethoven Festival Hall, conference, hotel and conferencing, and you see it's, 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 there's a whole kind of repertoire and then office buildings, the next category, we're moving to corporate headquarters and an office building, and again, I uh, don't want to go through institutional buildings, law courts, more office buildings, residential uh, towers, uh, um, a mixed use, um, office, uh, hotel, apartment, towers as a typology, and the, the, the discourse is about differentiating along the vertical axis and, and feeding and embedding in various ways into kind of ground surface and context, opening up in various ways. So there's kind of topics, first tower built, Abu Dhabi, um, institutional buildings in France, a new one in China was just mentioned, um, colony of also office space, kind of uh, retail or a commercial complex, kind of, is a typical one, the kind of the new primitive of the blob, kind of metaballing, making connections, creating indoor and outdoor spaces as a kind of new answer to create kind of a, a series of office blocks with, with retail on the ground and a kind of deep uh, multi-layered space of using the bridges to, to create a kind of uh, three-dimensional space of participation. These are a uh, big project in the center of Beijing. New business park in Cairo um, with a kind of retail landscape in the middle and uh, kind of, there's kind of uh, 18 double towers, uh, all different but all correlated, creating spatial Scenarios, uh, Expo uh, City, Cairo. These are real projects which are which are happening and ongoing. Another retail project in Italy, airport a competition loss, uh, bridges, and then the bridge which which has differential spans and, and picks up and is able to handle those. Um, villas on site as well. Just thought I'd throw some villas in because I'm in uh, 
California here is a villa in Russia, is a villa in Dubrovnik. Uh, but then also it's important to go down in scale, you know, pavilions, event spaces, event structures, um, exhibition spaces, hotel rooms, uh, kitchens, uh, furniture, and always trying to kind of create a field, create a spatial, make, make the furniture kind of space-making substance, a transient, uh, oops. Um, <laughs> kitchens, well, then we, we got into, we drawn into, you know, whether it's lighting fixtures, of course, elements, uh, handbags, display things, shelving systems. Um, it's endless, it's a kind of a whole world. You, you, you all can do it. You, we, we, uh, field conditions out of, out of aggregating elements. Um, uh, club in London, a reception desk, and a bar, which is a complex thing with many things kind of b embedded in, multi, multi organizing multi-event in, in a single kind of blob structure. I mean, um, uh, multi-systems, not just one kind of material shape with a uh, soft, hard, the pleats of the fabric correlating and resonating with the pleats of the fiberglass. Um, fireplaces, you name it. I mean, of course, always an as a parametric family rather than one, one product tailored. You can just uh, lighting fixtures, stools, a new desk, uh, shoes. I just wanted to come to this point. I mean, <laughs> parametrism is truly universal. <laughs> Sorry, it took a while. Should I finish here? I mean, I, I haven't finished, but maybe we should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just part two, part two. Part two. <laughs> the, which one? The oh, the five agendas, okay, well. <laughs> no, I mean, this was another one where I said, let's say, three projects, and I was clicking through, where I would say, we have delivered something which is kind of competing high performance, like in the city, each station different, each adapted, each recognizable. Models would just have the same station repeated. So this kind of sense of a genotype adapting to different conditions, absorbing different conditions, and it's a very successful project where we say no other style can do that, no other style can compete with that and deliver a kind of more satisfying solution to this, to this particular project. And um, there, there are a few um, uh, other built examples which, I've been uh, which have been successful. And particular, for instance, this, the bridge, which becomes an exhibition space, it recognizes it can set on it the landscape, it proliferates it. It, it, it ramifies its spaces, it's um, um, a kind of, let's say, very satisfying, complete, and mature result, I would say, where, where, where the kind of, again, it's a competition and well, well done. So it's, let's say, fully performing parametricism, fully winning out and arriving parametricism, where I wanted to say, it is real, it is happening. And uh, the agendas were, and maybe I, I'm not sure we get into it. First one was to say the emphasis on parametric, what I call accentuation, where you, I said, like I said before, you accentuate differences, you amplify, you use one kind of layer to reveal and make and transparent hidden layers. You like, you know, the the sec second one, you do that through multi-systems correlation. There is this whole research we had for three years at the DOL, parametric responsiveness, where, I mean, it was the most immediate. The stuff, the initial tool set came from the illumination industry, and there's so many mobile elements in architecture, all the doors, the windows, the, the roller blinds, the, the light switching on and off, uh, sliding doors, partitioning, furniture roaming around. And I say, take all this stuff, which is now kind of inert, and make that the kind of um, medium of, of responsiveness, give these elements uh, sensors and let them respond, so there's this aspect. And then there's a whole, and I will not go through it, idea of parametric figuration, 
where I'm saying move away, not only dealing with object parameters, that, uh, that the kind of you correlate the geometry uh, according to other geometry, to other elements, but think about ambient parameters and correlate those, sort of a light conditions, reflectivity, um, other ambient uh, values, and subject parameters. Put, think about the, the, the human body's subject positions, and you can do it in the computer with cameras, and camera moves, and, uh, and make that a key parameter, and make set up your scenes gestalt sensitive so that they respond and transform and transmute as the camera moves around. That is kind of thing important because one thing is uh, important in architecture that there is no object, well, nowhere in the world, all the orders and distinctions and, and whether you say there is not enough order, there's more order, or how we understand and navigate the world is of course depending on our kind of conceptual apparatus and, con and our conception, perception, and comprehension, and particularly in architecture, what I call the decomposition of the scene. What are the elements you distinguish, whether it is from one room to another, uh, one element, what kind of belongs together and what is set apart, what you pay attention to, is so always already much more ambiguous than in the, in the real world, in the world of objects and artifacts. I know that this pen is a pen and can move it against its background and uh, it has two parts and they come together. It's clearly that this is one entity and this is another because I can move them around. In architecture, everything is fixed and bolted together and rooted. It's very difficult. There's no clear criteria in what is one object versus another, whereas one zone starting and another. So there's a lot of play here for continuous reinterpretation. So I'm looking at uh, utilizing this to create a kind of built-in reflection on, on perception and, um, and, and, and think, think about you know, that you set up the, the, your designs and with the kind of multiply decomposable scenes where the camera movement and ambient conditions radically transform and reconfigure the space and you work with that. Uh, that is uh, parametric figuration, and the last one is parametricist urbanism, a kind of agenda which is put on the agenda here, but which, which I think I had also at DOL for three years kind of pushed. And these are the kind of five domains where I think um, 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 five frontiers of, of parametric uh, uh, work. But I think I'll stop here. <laughs>